on Jewish Gen to try and figure out who the people in the port in this particular painting are. So it's it's I mean it actually has great genealogical significance and it's kind of fun that that you selected it. It turns out it was one of those cases where um, it married into the family, but of course he was so important in his time that the family only remembered that he was related, not that it was through a marriage. So, and tell me again why you selected the painting just for the, the cover mm. for this? I, I think uh, when I st uh, just Googled uh, the expression Ashkenazic Jews, uh, images, and so I have seen uh, dozens of images and this one, uh, Please, may particularly, and I knew already this painting. Uh, I think it's a Polish uh, Jewish painter from the uh, end of 19th, uh, 19th century. Um, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> I, I have seen it in the past, but I, I selected it just because it is nice, I think. And I wanted to, to, to find a big picture of illustrating some uh, different categories of Ashkenazic Jews. Uh, well, nice. Nice All the stuff. young women, uh, men, uh, rabbi, uh, young men, etc. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, and of course, Gottlieb has himself in three stages of his life. So three of the people in the painting are are Gottlieb himself, mm. which is, is kind of humorous. Let's see if um, if people who are tuning in and here early and chatting with us, how many of them were able to identify the iconic. Uh, musical figures and actors and politicians uh, on the screen. How did they do, Sasha? Uh, Remember, on, only Sasha and I can see the see who actually you have selected. But uh, from what I'm looking at, you did a pretty good job. I don't see and that. Now people uh, globally, uh, everybody recognize uh, uh, Bob Dylan and uh, uh, Leonard Cohen. Uh, Yentl, uh, so Barbara Streisand uh, as Yentl is also recognized, but uh, it's more difficult, I think. Well, sometimes it's not Bob Dylan, but Robert Zimmerman, but it's still the same <laughs> person, of course. Uh, but uh, I think there is the biggest problem with uh, the man who is on the right, on the top, because there are many suggestions and uh, only uh, one half of them, I think, is correct. <laughs> By the way, um, uh, uh, and yes, I see also that several pe people recognize not only Barbara Streisand, but also the male uh, personage, Patinkin. Ah, uh, that's what I was thinking of, right. So this, is, uh, this, was, this one was the most difficult, I think. Uh, so, but uh, yeah. Bob Dylan's third wife, uh, I actually did a genealogy of her family and um, they decided they weren't sure if they wanted to put Bob Dylan uh, on the tree, this third wife on their tree because she'd been a playboy bunny. And they weren't quite sure that that was something they, they wanted to mention in the family history, but they did eventually mentioned she was a Playboy bunny. We're waiting just another moment or two for people who might be coming in late. Uh, for this very exciting Jewish Gen talk. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, okay, so well, uh, a, I think there is a, a dozen of different suggestions for Ben Gurion, actually. <laughs> <laughs> not people, not everybody recognized uh, in this old man, uh, David uh, Ben Gurion. Did uh, not but for everything, uh, everyone else, uh, it's it's okay. Easy. Did did they get Natalie Portman? Most of them. I I'm not. I didn't check. Uh, he looks like many other old Jewish men. I think. <laughs> and I he, he uh, contrary to Leonard Cohen, he has no special cap, and uh, so he is not actor. He is not a musician. Uh, so this is why I think his portrait is uh, less known than the all other person who are from the world of entertainment, mm -hmm. not political. And especially he is not a current but politician. So I think this explains many things. I think so. I think so. It's also interesting that that for the um, Tevia picture, a number of people put in Topol, which is, I guess, the actor's name, not necessarily the character's name. We know our stuff, huh? That's yeah. great. 
Okay. Well, I think we can begin. Um, it's time. Thank you, everyone who participated so much uh, so far, having a little fun with us. Uh, my name is Karen Franklin. I'm past co-chair of the Board of Governors of Jewish Gen and delighted to wish you a slightly early happy Hanukkah and to welcome each and every one of you to today's program, which is Roots of Jews from Eastern Europe, Names, Language, and History by Alexander Beider, Sasha. Uh, last week, we explored how genetic testing can provide insights into our ancestors' lives, struggles, and migration. This week, language is the tool to help us explore what Beider describes as a more nuanced picture. Bader. Uh, my name is Bader. Bader. <laughs> Not Bader. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just wait till I get to Transnistria and see how I do on that one. Um, thank you. Uh, today's talk is one in a series of Jewish Gen programs. You can learn more about the upcoming programs on jewishgen.org slash live, and you can get to that right on Jewish Gen's homepage. A recording of today's talk will be available on Facebook and YouTube shortly, and a notice will be posted on the discussion group when it becomes available. You may pose questions to the speaker on the Q&A, same place you've been using to place guesses as to whose photo was on the screen. And um, just a very um, brief bio, because many of you in the genealogy world already know uh, Sasha Bader, and most of you actually even know how to pronounce his name probably too. Uh, briefly, he has a PhD in applied mathematics and a second PhD in Jewish studies. He uses onomastics and linguistics as tools to unravel Jew the history of the Jewish people. He's written a series of reference books dealing with the etymology of Jewish names. They include, uh, but are not limited to, Dictionary of Ashkenazic Given Names, a Dictionary of surna Jewish Surnames in the Russian Empire, in the Kingdom of Poland and Galicia, and a complete biography can be found on the avotenu.com site, as well as um, the books themselves to order. Um, Sasha, thank you for joining us today. It's all yours. Okay, thank you, Fran uh, Karen, uh, for presenting me. So uh, today uh, we will speak about uh, roots of Ashkenazic uh, Jews uh, from Eastern Europe, particularly. My focus is really Eastern Europe and this talk. Uh, and uh, I will not speak here about DNA. I will not, I will really concentrate on domains on which I have some expertise. So names, language, and the history. Uh, we will be four parts. Uh, very quickly, I will uh, uh, have a, uh, I will give a, a general overview. Uh, then we will speak about uh, Western Ashkenazi migrants to Eastern Europe, Czech-speaking medieval Jews who also contributed to um, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, European Jewry, and East Slavic-speaking medieval Jews who also made some contribution. Uh, what is the simplified uh, textbook scheme of the genesis of Jewish community in Eastern Europe? I uh, presented it here. So the most uh, classical approach is uh, what we will find uh, in the textbooks is uh, we were Jews who lived in the medieval period in the Rhineland, uh, so Western Germany, along of the Rhine River. Uh, we came, uh, one part of them came from France, another part came from Italy, and then because of different persecutions, uh, we uh, moved, uh, where was a my mass migration from the West, uh, Western Europe to uh, Poland, and then uh, from uh, from Poland to uh, different parts of uh, of the future Russian Empire, so Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. Uh, I don't say that this scheme is incorrect, but I think uh, globally speaking, it corresponds to what I learned during the uh, years I studied uh, history, names, uh, and language of Jewish of, uh, Ashkenazic people, but I think it can be nuanced. And what I will try to do today is really to uh, provide you some 
uh, details uh, uh, concerning this uh, general uh, flow. Uh, so uh, Rhenish Jews, so Jews who lived in the medieval uh, period, um, really was a big contribution to Eastern Europe. So what I will present here on this scheme is as a uh, summary of what I will detail later during my talk. Uh, so there were several sources. And uh, we can say that there are three sources for the genesis of Jewish community in Eastern Europe. The first one is the uh, Jews from the Rhineland. It's a really big source. And uh, contrary to what is, what is usually uh, uh, consider it in some textbooks. Uh, Jews to the Rhine came from France. There is no, uh, not a single uh, factor that would imply a mass migration from Italy. And we know just about one family of, of colony names, uh, but uh, otherwise it's mainly from France. Uh, then there was a second source, which is, uh, smaller, seems smaller than the, uh, the uh, source from uh, Western Germany. Uh, it's the Jews who was Czech speaking, who lived uh, during the 10th uh, from, from 10th to 13th century uh, in the Czech lands and they was uh, Czech speaking. So this is the second source. And actually uh, nothing is known from where they came came uh, to uh, Bohemia and Moravia. But at any case, uh, there is no element that would suggest that this second source is a, 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 a of a shoot of uh, Rhenish Jews. So it appears that in the Middle Ages, from the 10th century, where these two uh, Jewish centers were independent. And then during the same time, there was a third uh, uh, area where some ancestors of Ashkenazic uh, Jews lived. It was in the territory of modern uh, Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, and as I will explain, the contribution of them is not zero, but it is very small in comparison to what uh, to the two first sources. And then, so. Uh, from uh, Ireland, a large part, uh, where was a large migration to Czech lands, where Jews who were coming from Ireland, uh, uh, where, where uh, was a merger between uh, Western migrants and Czech speaking Jews who lived there already before the migration of Jews from Western Germany. Then uh, this community, a uh, mixed community of uh, uh, German Jews, the Czech Jews, uh, uh, some representative of, uh, of it uh, moved to Poland. And then uh, we end up with the same scheme uh, that was suggested uh, from the uh, first simplified scheme. So this is a global picture. Uh, now, uh, some details. Uh, when I, uh, so to come to this picture, I uh, went through uh, decades of studying, and my first study was uh, concerning Jewish names, surnames from the Russian Empire. So you see my first publication was in 1993, a dictionary of Jewish surnames from the Russian Empire. Uh, then uh, there was a, a dictionary of Jewish surnames from the Kingdom of Poland uh, three years later, and then uh, uh, closing my uh, Eastern European uh, trilogy, uh, addiction of Jewish surnames from Galicia in 2004. And uh, actually when studying uh, these uh, surnames, uh, I was, I learned just where the ancestors of Eastern European Jews lived uh, at the moment when the names, last names were uh, assigned or uh, adopted. So it's just the beginning, uh, uh, the turn of the 19th century, not before, because very few names existed for Ashkenazic Jews before. And so uh, as I uh, became interested uh, during these studies of uh, last names, I became interested in the study of 
first names because they are much more older than their last names. And so this is why I wrote, uh, published a book concerning the uh, addiction of uh, traditional Ashkenazic uh, given names uh, with the etymology, with the historical references. And so this was the first time I thought really about uh, main elements of the history of the way uh, how the Eastern European Jewish community uh, became created. Because uh, looking into the history of given names uh, provides uh, rich information concerning uh, the uh, historical past of uh, Eastern European Jewry. And then during my work on uh, Ashkenazic, traditional Ashkenazic given names, I got interested in the history of the vernacular language of, uh, Jew of Ashkenazic Jews, uh, the Yiddish uh, language. And so this is why I worked after that uh, for about 10 years to publish, to, uh, to publish the book Origin of Yiddish, uh, Yiddish Dialects. And again, uh, this, this book is pure, uh, purely linguistic. It's uh, mainly uh, uh, technical, historical linguistics, but uh, for me, the aim of writing this book was mainly concentrated in the Appendix C to this book, uh, which is uh, five, five, uh, 50 pages in which I discuss the origin of uh, Ashkenazic Jews, as we can learn from uh, onomastic and uh, linguistic, uh, to, uh, using uh, onomastic and linguistic tools. So for me, uh, onomastics and uh, linguistics are mainly just tools for uh, working on the history of Jewish people. Uh, Western Ashkenazi migrants. So now we will speak about the three sources. So first of them, the uh, biggest one, according to uh, many uh, factors, Western Ashkenazi migrants to Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, what are the direct historical uh, arguments used uh, usually by historian to say that uh, numerous ancestors of Eastern Ashkenazic Jews lived in West Germany in the Rhineland? So we know that uh, before uh, the Black uh, Death uh, pogroms of 1349, there were flourishing uh, community in Western Germany. Uh, We know also that uh, there were mass uh, persecution, uh, persecutions, massacres during the First Crusade, uh, then uh, during the Black Death uh, Plague. And so uh, after that period, the community still existed in Western Germany, but a relatively small community in comparison to the previous period. And we also know that there were numerous expulsions. Uh, so many uh, Jews were expelled from numerous cities uh, and even to, uh, whole provinces like Bavaria, uh, Baden-Württemberg, etc. Uh, during the 15th, 16th centuries. So these are historical uh, direct data, but they do not speak about Eastern Europe. They speak about Western Europe. So uh, what is known about Eastern Europe? About Eastern Europe, we know that before the 14th century, uh, very few, uh, very few uh, elements are known, little evidence about Jewish presence uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, so small community existed, but uh, very small. Uh, we know about tolerance laws and invitation that was sent uh, by Polish kings uh, inviting uh, and uh, providing privileges for Jews to come uh, to Polish, uh, to Poland, or to Lithuania, or to Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, and we know that at least uh, since 16th and 17th centuries, we have flourishing community here. So again, here we have some facts concerning, direct facts concerning uh, Eastern Europe, but there is no direct link between these facts concerning Eastern Europe and what uh, I spoke about, uh, what I presented concerning Western Europe. So the links 
concerning uh, the migration from Western Europe to Eastern Europe are rather indirect. So all historical arguments are indirect. There is no historical trace of mass migration. We have not a single document uh, that would uh, suggest that there were many, new, uh, that there were numerous families who came at one year or during a few years from one place in Germany to Eastern Europe or to Poland, for example, nothing like that. All we know about uh, migration, it's always concern individuals or some families, but nothing exists on the historical, uh, historical uh, documents concerning mass migrations from Germany to Eastern Europe. Uh, we know some cultural uh, factors. So we know what religious right and communal structure in Eastern Europe uh, uh, during the last centuries was very similar to those of medieval Rhenish uh, Jewry. But this it is a cultural argument. And so this could, for this, uh, it does not imply necessarily that there was a mass migration because uh, just a few uh, very influential rabbis from Western Europe could bring, uh, could bring the religious, uh, main religious uh, elements uh, concerning the religious right of Jews, and also uh, we could uh, coin the communal structure according to the communal structure we knew in Western Europe. So for this, this is of course a fact, but this factual information does not speak about mass migration. It speaks just about influential rabbis. Uh, what is the, another uh, factor? Uh, it is a very uh, important linguistic argument. We know for that uh, during the last centuries, uh, Jews, all Jews in Eastern Europe spoke e Yiddish. And Yiddish is a Germanic language, a uh, high Germanic language. So, uh, of course, this is an important factor, but actually it does not suggest uh, from what, it, it does not tell us uh, from what area of Germany uh, Jews came to Eastern Europe. Uh, it just tells that Jews came uh, a large, uh, an, an important portion of Jews of Eastern uh, Europe or their ancestors came from German speaking areas. But it does not say, just the fact that Yiddish, Yiddish was the vernacular language does not say from what exact uh, German speaking area they came. Uh, and actually, uh, even if German base is perfectly is visible, is it perfectly visible in Yiddish lexicon and morphology, there is no trace in Yiddish of German dialects from the Rhineland. So if we look to the dialect uh, features of uh, German dialects, as were known, for example, in uh, Cologne area, Ripuarian uh, dialect, or in the uh, Mosel Franconian, uh, a part of the Western Europe, or Hessian, which covers Frankfurt, uh, Pfalzisch, etc. So if we take all these areas of Western Germany, Germany that correspond to the Rhineland, uh, we have, uh, we had historically and still have uh, in the, for the rural population in Germany, uh, many uh, linguistic peculiarities. We don't find these peculiarities in Eastern Yiddish. Uh, so what are the exact traces of the vernacular tongue used by medieval Jews from the island that we can find in Eastern Yiddish? We, we have some of them. Uh, they do not correspond to uh, dialectal features of German dialects from Western Germany, but still as we, if we compare uh, modern Yiddish uh, spoken and written during the last century in Eastern Europe to the written sources uh, that were compiled in Western Germany uh, from, beginning from the uh, um, medieval period, 
we can find that some of these linguistic features found in all Western Ashkenazic sources, we find them in Yiddish of Eastern Europe as well. So what are these elements? Uh, we have a series of specifically Jewish words uh, they do not exist in uh, German. Ooh, they do exist, but they do not have exactly the same meaning in German for German Christians. I, I made just a few examples. For example, learner as, as a meaning. Uh, so, of course, the verb learning uh, to study exists in German, but learner as Talmudic scholar, it, is, it, it exists only in Yiddish. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we find this meaning, uh, meaning already in medieval sources from Western Germ Germany. Chloe's uh, is a house of worship and study for Jews, again, in the same category. Uh, this meaning is already known uh, in Western Germany, and we find it in uh, Yiddish of Eastern Europe. Uh, Yortzeit University uh, of Death is exactly from the same category. And uh, I gave just three examples, uh, but actually uh, there are uh, several dozens of uh, examples of like that. But again, uh, these examples just show that we were brought from Western Germany, but uh, they do not testify about the uh, mass migration because uh, these, all these terms are uh, re related directly to religious uh, life in Western Germany. And so we could just be brought by some uh, itinerant rabbis, uh, so influential rabbis who could introduce them in the language of uh, Jewish uh, or Jews of Eastern Europe. Uh, now, uh, another important factor uh, which was discussed at length uh, in the uh, very important work uh, on the uh, history of Yiddish uh, made by German uh, linguist Erika Thiem, uh, Yiddish words uh, from German roots, uh, of German roots, that came to Eastern Europe mainly, or at least uh, partly, uh, uh, because of the written tradition of biblical translation. So, there are uh, several hundreds of, of words uh, that have a specific meaning uh, in Yiddish, which does not exist in German, uh, dialects uh, used by Christians, and we find them all in uh, Eastern Yiddish as well. But actually, we can be explained it by the fact that uh, from the very small age, uh, Jewish boys was studying uh, in uh, studying the Bible in uh, in Heder, in the Heder, and uh, we, when we were studying the Bible, we were not studying Yiddish, but we were studying in Yiddish, and so uh, for these studies, it was a very important procedure of using uh, biblical translation from Hebrew to Yiddish, and uh, there was a established a tra a tra tradition of biblical translation, and this tra uh, tradition came from the west to east. And so through these translations, many words peculiar to Western Europe that we find in, uh, already in medieval sources from Western Europe, they also came to Eastern Europe. Uh, we also have some hybrid Hebrew-German uh, words that also existed already in Western uh, Germany. Uh, for example, Schechten with uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew uh, root and uh, the ending from German, Rebetzin, again with the Hebrew root and very unusual ending, which is not Hebrew. Uh, but again, these words, uh, we have uh, dozens of that uh, words uh, that also came uh, their first references to these words are known in Western Germany already. And uh, for the uh, words of Hebrew, uh, Yiddish words of Hebrew origin, uh, many of them have, uh, again, several dozens of them have a pronunciation 
which is not, which cannot be uh, directly uh, deduced from uh, the uh, way of vocalization. So if we uh, look into the uh, neku dot, uh, into the uh, diacritic signs, so Hebrew signs uh, of for this word, uh, uh, we will not be able uh, to explain why, for example, uh, the word for Pesach is not Pesach, but Pesach in Yiddish, why uh, uh, it is uh, Toches or Tuches, but not Taches, uh, etc. So we, uh, for explaining this, uh, we need to conjecture that there was an oral tradition, and this specific pronunciation on all these uh, words, uh, we have a special pronunciation, uh, which for which we have the earliest references already uh, in uh, sources from Western uh, Germany. Uh, I put the uh, pictures for a few of these words. I, I decided at the last moment not to, to provide a picture for one of these words. Uh, very numerous uh, lexical neologisms also appeared uh, in Western uh, Germany, and we find them in Eastern Yiddish as well. And also there were some morphological changes. For example, uh, in Hebrew, we have only new, uh, masculine and feminine, uh, but in German, there are three genders. There is also a neuter gender. And for a number of common nouns of Hebrew origin in Yiddish, we have no neuter uh, gender, and actually, in sources from Western Germany, we find already exactly for these words the same neuter gender. gender. Uh, we also find in the Yiddish a uh, so less than 20, but still a, about 10, I, I would say, uh, words uh, which are of old French origin. So, uh, of course, no Jews came uh, to Eastern Europe from medieval France, but exactly the same words, uh, actually some of them have just French, old French uh, roots, but the ending is already German. Uh, even changes, uh, some of changes are already German. So all these words were part of the vernacular language of Jews who lived in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in the Rhineland area in the Middle Ages. And so the fact uh, that the same words are found in Eastern Yiddish also testifies uh, about the migration of people who were using these words in their vernacular life uh, in, uh, uh, in Western Germany. And there is also, in addition to these few words, which are clearly of old French origin, uh, there is a very basic word, benchen, to bless. Uh, we don't know for sure what, uh, whether it is based on uh, old French or old Italian or old uh, southern French. So it's, it, there are different theories. Uh, none of them is uh, totally satisfactory, but at least what is for sure, it is that, that this is a word of Romans origin. So again, it testifies about the migration of Jews from uh, Roman speaking uh, areas in the Middle uh, Ages to Western Germany. And then uh, gr gradually uh, this word also came uh, with migrants, uh, gradually it came also to Eastern Europe as well. Uh, what are the arguments uh, related to names concerning the origins of uh, Jews from uh, uh, of Eastern European Jews, uh, their links to Western Germany? Here, the uh, uh, factors are much more numerous. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, we should not use an incorrect uh, argument. So sometimes I have seen already in uh, uh, different uh, works, even a very uh, important scholarly works, uh, this uh, argument that in Eastern Europe, we have uh, these names like Halpern, Shapira, Landau, Minz, Gunzburg, uh, Katzenbogen, Epstein, Bachrach, uh, uh, all of them are based on names of towns or cities in the Rhineland area. 
Uh, and uh, we also know that Lurie and Margolis were already found in, in, uh, in the Western, uh, in the Rhineland area since the Middle Ages. And since these names are actually the most uh, common names uh, for Jews, uh, in addition to uh, Cohen and Levy, uh, this mean, would mean that uh, they testify about mass migration uh, to, uh, from Western Europe to Eastern Europe. For me, this, uh, this argument is false. Because uh, some of these uh, names, for example, Ginsburg, also known as uh, Ginsberg, Ginsburg, or Halpern, also known in Russia as Galperin, uh, Ukatsan and Bogen, they, appears, they appear for the first time, not in the Middle Ages, but only in the 16th century. And some other of them could be in the 15th century. But what's the, what is the most important? is that all these names are not names of simple Jews, where all of them belong to rabbinical dynasties. And all uh, these rabbinical dynasties were very fond of their ichas. And so uh, this is why uh, this was the only layer of, uh, in Eastern Europe of Jews who were really, for whom surnames were really important. And so, only these rabbinical families were these rabbinical families were, were the only families that had hereditary fixed uh, surnames even before the laws uh, uh, obliged uh, forced uh, Jews at the turn of the 19th century uh, to take a, a fixed name. So as these uh, names were very prestigious and this, as we uh, are known for already many uh, centuries. Uh, for some of them, uh, it is quite understandable that we have many, many bearers of this name uh, in Eastern Europe, but it does not speak about, uh, this does not provide any information about mass migration, it's just information is about the migrations of rabbinical families, or very uh, specific rabbinical families, about, uh, where, where I, about 20 names like that. Uh, for given names, given names is much more important uh, factor. For example, uh, we know, uh, I put here the list of, uh, it's not a complete list, it's a, just a partial list of female and male name, uh, which are uh, of ultimate French origin. But actually, uh, they did not again uh, came uh, to Eastern Europe from France, they came from France, medieval France, to medieval West Germany, from medieval West Germany, gradually they came uh, through the intermediary of the Czech lands mainly to Eastern Europe. Uh, so this, uh, there are about 20 names like that, but if we take uh, all the Yiddish names uh, that are based on uh, German language, uh, you will see that almost all common first names of Yiddish, uh, of, uh, in Yiddish, are already, uh, that were used during the last two, a century in Eastern Europe, they actually, with uh, earliest references, are known from Western Germany. And as since Jews were uh, not uh, given, uh, assigning names uh, in honor of uh, their rabbis, uh, at least not until recently, um, these names were inherited from one generation to another generation because of the tradition of Ashkenazic Jews to uh, uh, name their children uh, in honor of the deceased uh, relatives. So the fact that we find all these names, like uh, very common names uh, uh, derived fr from uh, uh, animal names like bear, hirsch, leib, wolf, uh, many other names like Anshel, Gimpel, Koifman, Lieberman, Zelikman. I'm still speaking about first names uh, that were used since the uh, Middle Ages in uh, uh, Western Germany. Uh, names were, that were based on German versions of biblical names like Isaac for uh, Isaac in English, Abel from Abraham, Note from Nathan, uh, Zalman from Solomon, uh, Zanwell from Samuel, Zimmel from Simon, and numerous. Uh, female name like Blume, Brian, Freide, Frume, Golde, Eidel, Mine, Shane, Zelda, etc. Uh, and uh, even uh, what was brought also from Western Europe is 
some, uh, there are just uh, two uh, uh, Greek names with uh, uh, of ultimate Greek uh, origin, Kalman as uh, with originated from Kalanimus, uh, Etobras, Todras from Theodorus, but again, they did not come to Eastern Europe directly from Greece. They came from Greece in the uh, antiquity to, the, to Rome, from Rome to Italy and France, from Italy and France, they came to Western Germany, and from Western Germany, they came to Central Europe, and from Central Europe, they finally came to Eastern uh, Europe. But again, uh, Western Germany was one of the intermediary points during this migration of these uh, Greek uh, names of Greek of ultimate Greek uh, origin. Uh, this is uh, so. Uh, these are the uh, elements that provide us an information. Uh, voluminous uh, information concerning, important information concerning the uh, Western Ashkenazi roots of many ancestors of Jews from Eastern Europe. Uh, second source uh, is Czech speaking medieval Jews. Uh, it's a second major source. So Jews who lived from the 10th to the 13th century in the Czech lands and were speaking in their everyday life, the old Czech language, uh, the language of their uh, Christian uh, neighbors. Uh, during the Middle Ages, as we know, as we learn from historical sources, Jews who lived in uh, the territory of the modern Czech Republic, uh, so the historical provinces of Bohemia and Moravia, uh, they lived not only in this area of the uh, modern Czech Republic, uh, we uh, find uh, in the historical sources in the Middle Ages uh, traces of Jews from this area in Bavaria, in Eastern Germany, in uh, Krakow, so in the Western Poland, in uh, the territory that later became Galicia, uh, so uh, now Ukra Ukra uh, Ukraine, uh, in different parts of Poland, excuse me, uh, and uh, also in Hungary and Vienna. So in the Middle Ages, we find uh, uh, Jews who were speaking Czech and who were bearing names uh, based on, on the old Czech language uh, in all this area. So it, it was a large area that was populated uh, in the Middle Ages by Jews uh, from the Czech lands. And then, as, as I explained it at the beginning of my lecture, uh, Jews, uh, there were Jews from Western Germany who came here and who merged with uh, Czech-speaking Jews. And like that, Czech uh, Jews also, uh, starting with the 13th century, they gradually switched to a Germanic, uh, to German-based language uh, in their everyday life. Uh, but before they did it, they were speaking uh, old Czech language. And we do find traces of this old Czech language spoken by Jews in uh, the Czech, uh, in the territory of Czech Republic in Eastern Europe, uh, in Eastern Yiddish. So, uh, for example, there is a very peculiar set of first names that we find in uh, Eastern Europe during the last centuries, including numerous female names like Dobre, Udobruske, uh, Drazne, uh, that gave rise to Yiddish name Drezel, Hvoles, Rode, or Rude, uh, Rode in uh, Litvak area, Rude in the Polish and the Ukrainian uh, area, uh, Slave, or Slovi, Sluvi, Czerne, that became, uh, that gave rise in Poland to Czarne, Zlate. Uh, so all these uh, names existed already. They were used already by Czech-speaking Jews in the Middle Ages, uh, and they were brought into Eastern Europe during uh, different uh, periods from the uh, Middle Ages until the last migration of Czech Jews that uh, took place uh, until the mid-17th century. Uh, so all these names were gradually brought to Eastern Europe. And uh, very few male names, Banish, Hlavne, uh, these are actually the, the only two examples. But for female names, 
uh, there are also uh, five or six other additional names that were brought from uh, Eastern, from Czech lands to Eastern Europe. And we also have about, maybe about 20 words in Yiddish of Eastern Europe uh, with old Czech roots. Uh, some of them, I, I gave just a few examples. Uh, for example, the verb trebern, to remove forbidden parts from meat, uh, it, is, it has an old Czech root and the ending is Germanic. Uh, the word uh, parve, upareve, uh, meaning neither dairy nor no meat, again, is of old Czech origin. Uh, and different parts or different parts of animal or different uh, uh, kind of meat, like uh, uh, for butchery hand, uh, headquarters, for front part of animal uh, white meat. Uh, these words uh, from, uh, are also of old Czech origin. And we also have uh, very um, important words uh, like uh, family, uh, family members, like Zeide, which is of doubtless old Czech uh, origin because uh, the, the initial Z uh, came to life in Poland, but the original form Deide uh, came clearly from the old Czech uh, language, uh, Deide. And uh, uh, Bobby could be of old Polish or old Czech uh, origin, but as Zeide is clearly of old Czech origin, I don't see any reason why uh, grandfather would come from old Czech and grandmother would uh, come from old Polish. So normally I think Bobby is also of the Bobby or Bubi in Poland and uh, Zajda in Poland. Uh, uh, these two words uh, came, uh, their ancestors came from old Czech. And there is also an interjection, uh, Nebech in uh, Yiddish uh, of Eastern Europe, uh, meaning poor thing. It survived in American slang as Nebish. Uh, it is, again, it is an old Czech word uh, that started to be used by Jews uh, already uh, in Central Europe uh, in the Middle Ages. What is important about these words? It's not their number. Their number is small. There is about maybe 20 words or not more that, uh, can, uh, that re reveal uh, the old uh, Czech origin. What is important, it is the domain, the, uh, the semantic domain to which we belong. Uh, you see it's uh, um, family members and also all this concerning uh, food, uh, it is highly re uh, closely related to religion. And so as we find this word in Eastern, words in Eastern Europe, we can be sure that they were not in, uh, borrowed from Czech Jews, they were really inherited from Czech Jews. So Czech Jews, when they uh, switched from their old Czech language to the ancestor of Yiddish, Germanic language, uh, they still kept uh, as a, uh, traces of their previously uh, used uh, language, old Czech, some basic words, uh, words related to their religion and uh, words related to uh, uh, to uh, family mem uh, members. And so it is important, very important, what is important to know, and this was the topic of, uh, the main topic of, of my book uh, published five years ago, uh, the book called Origin of Yiddish Dialects, that uh, the dialect of German, which is the basis of uh, uh, of Yiddish uh, Eastern of Yiddish of Eastern Europe, according to its uh, phon uh, phonology and morphology, it is the Bohemian German uh, spoken that was spoken in the for, uh, in the modern Czech uh, lands, uh, but it was spoken in this area in uh, around Prague. Uh, by Czech, uh, by former Czech speakers, uh, both Jewish and Christians, because in uh, Prague and the different other urban uh, places, uh, Jew, not only Jews, but also Christians uh, switched during this period, medieval period, from old Czech to uh, 
to a dialect of German. And so this dialect of German that was spoken by both Jews and Christians in uh, the Czech uh, lands, and also it was to this dialect that Jews from Western Europe, when they came to Czech lands, they switched. So this uh, language became the linguistic basis for Eastern Yiddish. And a few words to finish our lecture, uh, a few words concerning Islamic speaking medieval Jews. So this was a third source, but minor one. Uh, Jews who during the Middle Ages lived in the area which now corresponds to Ukraine and Belarus, uh, Belarus, uh, Belarus. Uh, uh, of course, contrary to other slides, uh, pictures what you see uh, below do not correspond to Jews. They correspond to different various uh, who, uh, warriors who lived uh, who lived at different uh, periods in these areas. Uh, but why I put them? It is because there is a very controversial uh, theory concerning these Jews to be. Uh, uh, descendants of uh, Hazars. And so I will not speak about this in detail because uh, this is a topic for a separate, uh, this is a separate topic. And especially you see here, I wrote about this on three pages, just a, a vulgarization uh, concerning this topic. And this was for, uh, published it by forward in uh, uh, three years ago in September 25, 2017. So if you search it forward uh, by my name, Alexander Bader, you will find this article. I explain in detail why, uh, why uh, the Hazar origin is really impossible. Uh, if, if it is possible, it, is, it will, would be extremely minor. Uh, and uh, globally speaking, Ashkenazi Jews in Eastern Europe we do not descend from uh, Hazars, who were the converts to Judaism uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, the Turkic people who, uh, whose el uh, elite uh, converted to Judaism at the end of the first millennium. Um, uh, so what is important, uh, what are the elements uh, we know from history? After the Mongol invasion uh, during the 13th century, uh, before the Mongol invasion, we have some sources that speak about the presence of Jews in Kiev, Chernigov, and a few other places in uh, what now uh, belongs to Ukraine, uh, and even to Russia, because there are a few references to Vladimir in Russia, uh, if, uh, reference one year, reference to a few persons who lived uh, there. Uh, but mainly uh, the ter ter territory of modern Ukraine. But after the Mongol invasion, all these uh, references disappear. Uh, and uh, reference to uh, Jews are, are known only in Western Ukraine, which was not uh, taken by Mongols. Uh, so the territory of Volhynia, what later beca uh, became known as Galicia, so Lvov area, uh, Vladimir Volinsky area, Lutsk area. And at least since the end of the 14th century, we know also about the presence of Jews in Belarus, uh, in Grodno and uh, Brest. Uh, but we don't know exactly uh, from where this uh, uh, small community, uh, uh, members of this small community came. Uh, we know that about among this, uh, uh, we know also that we're speaking Eastern Slavic language with the ancestor of modern Ukrainian and Belarusian languages. We know also that a few Ashkenazim, but scholars who lived among them, and origin of others is not known, but there is no uh, reason to consider them to be uh, either of Western or convert origin. Most likely, origin would be that these were. Uh, descendants of people who uh, migrate, Jews who migrated uh, to this area from uh, Byzantine Empire, so the modern Turkey uh, or Western, uh, North, uh, Western uh, Greece. But again, this would be uh, partly speculative because 
uh, all information we have, it is uh, indirect. Uh, we know that we were speakers of the local East Slavic language before the 15th and 16th centuries. And, but what is important uh, to uh, evaluate their size and their importance for the uh, contribution to Eastern European Jewry is that we don't find any linguistic legacy of them. And we know that uh, Yiddish became the native language of all Jews of uh, all of Eastern Europe during the 16th, 17th century. And in this language, as I uh, presented you before, there are many numerous, uh, there are numerous traces of German uh, from uh, Central Europe, of uh, from German, some German specifically Jewish words that were created in Western Europe by Jews. Uh, we have uh, traces of old French, we have traces of old Czech, but no trace of East Slavic language that was speaking, spoken by Jews who lived uh, before they, uh, they merged with the uh, migrants from the West. And this implies uh, that uh, the, uh, the number of people uh, of, uh, um, of the population of this East Slavic uh, speaking uh, community was rather small. And uh, we have, uh, we know for them that they had a very peculiar set of given names because there are some uh, documents that survive it that show the names that we uh, used in this uh, community, especially in Grodno. But of all these given names, very few survived. And actually, I know just one male name, which is Shachne, that was, uh, which is a legacy of these uh, Jews who lived uh, in the Middle Ages in the territory of Ukraine, and also Badane, uh, Vichne, these are the female names uh, in Yiddish uh, whose ancestors uh, were used uh, like Bahdane and Vichna by uh, East Slavic Jew Jews who lived in the territory of uh, Eastern Europe before uh, migrants from Eastern, Western Europe or Central Europe came. So uh, just the last slide, we see here that according to different uh, uh, criteria and different arguments and factors, it is impossible to explain historical, demographic, cultural, linguistic, onomastic features uh, known for Eastern Europe without conjecturing Western migration whose total value during the long period until uh, it lasted until mid 17th century, dwarfed that of the local East Slavic speaking uh, community. Thank you for your attention. And so, uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, I will look into the question that were sent. And if you have uh, some general question, don't hesitate to ask them uh, by uh, this section. I will, I will just see. Sasha, uh, I'll take a moment while you're looking at the questions. There are hundreds of wonderful questions that were sent in by the <laughs> 2,100 people who have attended this talk. Uh, just incredible. And uh, you've touched on many areas of interest to all of them. We usually end at exactly uh, 3 o'clock but we'll stay a little longer so that Sasha can answer some of these really good questions. So let me just make a few comments now in case you can't all stay uh, to remind you that you can go to jewishgen.org slash live uh, to sign up for um, uh, Dr. Bader's talk next week, Dr. Bader's talk next week, uh, and also another, ta another talk on uh, Sunday at noon for a workshop researching your Bessarabian and Transnistria Jewish roots with jewishgen.org with uh, Ina Vader, Vayner and Yafim Kogan. And of course, next week, uh, 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 Dr. Bader will be talking about Jewish roots from the Ottoman Empire, names and history. That's uh, next week at the exact same time. Um, and and um, Sasha, do you have a handout of any sort for this? talk or where can people get more uh, well i can actually share the uh, pdf with all my slides if it is of interest uh, i can send this yes okay or maybe what uh, yes we if they look back to the site i'm wondering perhaps we could even um, put it in the jewish gen discussion group yeah uh, as 
as an yeah, attachment. Yeah. So people have it that way yeah. as well. Okay, so I see uh, already some general questions. What was the sources of Rhineland jewelry? Uh, according to my study of Yiddish language and uh, first names used by Jews, the only source I see for the Rhineland jewelry is uh, Jews from northern France. That's the only source which is undeniable. And uh, we know just about one family, as I saw, said, about from Italy. Uh, but uh, otherwise, a majority, a large portion of Rhineland uh, Jews came from northern France. Uh, are you finding in agreement with other ex ex experts? Uh, well, uh, for names, it's difficult to say because uh, unfortunately, no other than me was. Uh, uh, ever interested in the, in, among scholars about uh, first names or last names. Uh, for uh, history and for Yiddish, uh, of course, there are numerous experts. And uh, globally, uh, as I said, uh, the, my big picture is not that different from the usual picture, because if we return to the uh, If we return to the uh, simplified scheme here, globally, I don't, uh, I agree. Uh, but uh, what I am just emphasizing is that uh, the layer of Czech lands, uh, the second source was also of importance. But uh, I think all experts agree with me also. I, I agree a lot with them that, uh, the source for uh, the third source, uh, East Slavic Jews, was, was very small. So I, I think uh, my only uh, uh, personal contribution, I would say, is the emphasizing the importance on this part and uh, showing that it is an important source, not only for Jews uh, of Eastern Europe globally, but also for Yiddish language. And uh, if, uh, while other experts usually, uh, either they consider that Czech Jews were uh, descendants of Rhenish Jews, but actually there is no, uh, this would be speculative, or they consider that this was a very small layer and I hope that the arguments I provided, my works on Yiddish first names and, and Yiddish language, I was sufficiently uh, cogent uh, to, to show that uh, my uh, opinion uh, here is uh, not wrong. Um, Does the migration of Jews include those who came from Spain and Portugal? On the individual level, yes, but on the uh, family mass level, absolutely not. Because uh, we have, uh, of course, we have a few families that came to Poland a different period from various Sephardic community. But uh, uh, these were just individuals. Uh, so uh, there were no uh, migrants, uh, groups of migrants from Spain or Portugal who, who came to Eastern Europe. The only exception is the community of the uh, city of Zamosh in southern Poland, where uh, uh, at the end of 16th century, there was a uh, purely Sephardic community uh, but this community gradually disappeared. Uh, this was a community mainly uh, uh, founded by Jews from Italy who were mainly uh, of uh, Portuguese, uh, so ex-Marano uh, origin, uh, ex-Catholic. But uh, gradually uh, this community disappeared because it was totally isolated. And uh, the people who did not 
returned to Ottoman Empire or other places where there was Sephardic community, they just merged with the Ashkenazic Jews who, be, uh, who uh, came uh, later to the same area. But uh, in the list of names, last names is uh, used in Zamosh, even in the 20th century, I was able to find one name uh, that was clearly one of the names uh, uh, well, because there were about 20 family maybe that lived, Sephardic family that lived, who lived in the Zamosh at the end of the 16th century, and at least one of them, uh, the surname, uh, survived until the 20th century in the same, uh, same area. But otherwise, it was a single case, and all other cases are just a few rabbis, a few physicians of Sephardic Jews, but otherwise, no. Uh, Uh, the way as a dictionary are available, uh, of course, they're available on Amazon, but uh, the better, better place is Avutain, because all my dictionary were uh, published by Avutain Incorporation. And so I, I think that the prices on Avutain site are maybe better than on Amazon. Uh, how were the surnames for these books chosen? Uh, well, I tried to be exhaustive uh, when I uh, I used a very representative, almost com uh, almost exhaustive sources for all this area. And of course, I could not uh, be totally exhaustive, but uh, according to different estimation, I think uh, for all areas for which I published etymological, etymological dictionaries, uh, my books cover more than 90% of names. Uh, people who know Yiddish have told me that it is closer to Swiss German than to other German dialects. Does this tie in with anything else known about the origin of Eastern European Jewish community? Uh, well, uh, no, 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 no scholar who studied Yiddish would say that Yiddish is closer to Swiss German uh, than to other German dialects. For example, Yiddish is clearly closer to Bavarian. Uh, uh, dialect went to Swiss uh, uh, German. And uh, even as I said, Eastern Yiddish is even closer than, uh, but there are many uh, features of Bavarian, uh, very major features which are not found in Eastern Yiddish. Uh, while uh, if we consider the medieval uh, language, uh, German dialect that was spoken in the Czech lands in the Middle uh, Ages, uh, according to almost all is a main feature, ling linguistic feature, I mean, phonetic and uh, morphological, uh, Yiddish agrees with him. And again, I'm speaking about Eastern Yiddish, not about Yiddish spoken in Alsace and Switzerland. Uh, this is Western Yiddish uh, that uh, came from other German dialects, but not uh, whose, whose German, uh, uh, German basis is uh, not the same German dialects. And, as the German basis for Eastern Yiddish. Uh, Saxon German native understood the Yiddish song. Uh, yes, but again, we are speaking Yiddish. Uh, when we speak about Yiddish, what is important to say? Yiddish is not like uh, German in uh, Northern Germany and Hamburg, for example, this is for sure. Inders, uh, Yiddish is, uh, sounds as a mixture of southern and central German uh, German uh, dialects, and actually Saxonian or Upper Saxonian is uh, one of the central uh, German uh, dialects, and uh, Bavarian is another uh, Upper German, so Southern German. And so, like that, we will find uh, e e Bavarian speaker can understand many elements in Yiddish as well. Uh, Saxonian speaking can understand many uh, elements as well, but uh, Jews from, uh, not Jews, excuse me, Christian from Cologne will not understand many things in, in Yiddish. And in Switzerland, uh, it will be also different, uh, difficult. Uh, did the Jews speak Yiddish at home and with their fellow Jews and the local language with the other people living in the, the area? 
of course. Of course, Jews everywhere uh, were at least uh, bilingual, but many of them we were uh, trilingual because we also uh, knew, or at least we were sensitive to, to know uh, Hebrew, uh, to be able to speak, to pray. Uh, I am speaking about men, of course. Uh, but uh, men and women were, of course, uh, even if we were speaking Yiddish, we were speaking uh, other languages with uh, people living around. And this is why we have so many influences of Polish, of Ukrainian, of uh, uh, Belarusian, of, uh, on Yiddish. But these are the rather recent uh, influences, especially for uh, the most recent ones are from Russian. Uh, but for Pol Polish was influencing Jews, uh, Jew uh, Yiddish, since the Middle Ages, and uh, Ukrainian and uh, Belarusian since the at least the 16th century. Uh. Does the absence of information about mice migration from Germany mean that it was believed that Jews weren't worth mentioning as a historic reference. Uh, I don't see why it would be like that. For me, uh, if there is no mention of mass migration, that means that there were no mass migration because otherwise we would find some uh, information in Christian or Jewish sources, but we have not a single uh, point that would uh, direct uh, reference that would say, speak about mass migration. And then you will find in uh, different textbooks, uh, which are just vulgarizing uh, history, information about uh, numerous German Jews who uh, left Germany after the first crusade uh, at the end of the first uh, of 11th century, or numerous Jews who left Germany uh, after the Black Death uh, massacres in the middle of the 14th century, uh, this is a pure speculation because the only data we have, we know that some Jews migrated from these one uh, places in Germany to other places in Germany. We don't have any information about mass migration from Germany to, uh, to Eastern Europe, uh, but uh, we do have information about individuals and families who were migrating, not mass migrating, but permanent gradual flow from west to east during several centuries. And so this is why uh, we, we, uh, get, uh, we obtained the situation uh, with uh, a majority of ancestors who, li uh, who lived in Western Europe, but with, we, we never came as a mass migration. It was a gradual, series of uh, families migrating during the long century from west to east. Uh, are there Yiddish words that, uh, with an Islamic basis based on migration through Spain? No, we have just one word of Arabic origin uh, in Yiddish, uh, but this word was already used uh, in uh, Western G Germany, so it was, it came from uh, Spain, the word came, not the people came, but the word came from Spain during the Middle Ages to France, from France to Germany, and uh, so on. So uh, very, uh, and it was one word for one particular object in synagogue, but otherwise uh, nothing, uh, of course. But uh, there are some uh, French, uh, some, some first names like Schneer, uh, Bendit, and uh, what else? I've Vivus, Fivus, Fivus. So I, I found three first names, male, that came uh, to Eastern Europe from Central Europe. To Central Europe, they came from uh, Western Europe. From to Western Europe, they came from France, and to France, uh, Northern France, they came from Southern France, and from South to Southern France, they came from Spain. So uh, I know only three names like that. Uh, it is Schneier, uh, whose ancestor is Spanish senor. Uh, uh, also, uh, 
Faibus, or Faibus, whose ancestor is uh, Vivus. Uh, this name was used in northern Spain and southern France in the Middle Ages. Uh, so these are the these names uh, where uh, ancestors uh, were, uh, were existing already in uh, Spain. But again, uh, they never came from Spain to Eastern Europe directly. They came from Spain to France, from France to Western Germany, from Western Germany to Czech lands, and from uh, Czech lands to Eastern Europe. Um, uh, hi, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, hi, uh, Sasha and Karen. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up. So okay. um, I'm not sure if you want to find another way to answer these questions, if you want to um, provide another way for the attendees to contact you to answer your questions answer their questions rather? Uh, yes, maybe it would be worth, uh, well, I don't think I will physically have a possibility to answer all these questions. Maybe it would be better to uh, to post them on Averte, uh, on, on, on G -G -Gen, uh, site uh, website and I will select some of them uh, which are the most general interest. Otherwise, uh, as an answer to question concerning particular families, you can find them in my books. Uh, Thank you. And I just want to, to quote one of the uh, questions that came in, one of the comments was, we can't thank you enough. And that is certainly the case. And we look forward to hearing from you next week, same place, same time. And uh, bring us some more photos. I know the scientists, I think you said, were your favorites to see if people can recognize scientists. So next week, hopefully, we'll take a little time at the beginning of the session and uh, see if we can identify scientists, which will probably, for most of us, be a little bit more difficult no. than, uh, than Yento. Nobody will be able to recognize. Yeah, exactly. You get extra credit. I need to take a... Uh, uh, Politicians or actors or actresses. Uh, Throw in a few for some of us. Thank you so much. And uh, thank all of you for participating. We look forward to see you, seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.